Oh, he's got the On The Wrong Lead shirt on there. Uh, we're back with the uh, the normal little intro music here, drinking champagne. Uh, Andrew, um, so I got made a complete liar uh, when I tweeted out that we were going to record this weekend. <laughs> and uh, just just like, like the last week, uh, I mean, it's just been a bear. Um, <clears throat> and like it really has nothing really to do with – uh with with horse racing or with 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 our on the wrong lead stuff or anything like that or <clears throat> i mean we missed we missed the dates i think because because of your travel and like we we kind of i think got our, our days mixed up and stuff but man like i've been like so like laser focused with work and like <clears throat> getting stuff done and like by the end of the day wanting to be so done with work that like it's just <laughs> been like i don't know it's been a really, really just like crazy, crazy week, uh, maybe even two weeks, basically since I got back from Vegas. So, um, but we're recentered. We're back on our, our kind of normalish day. Uh, we're getting this out on Wednesday. Um, we and, there uh, is one there is one thing where you can tell you're not quite yourself yet. Hmm. Hi, Mark. How you doing? Oh my goodness, my name is Mark, dude. <laughs> Man, so. Let you want you want to hear a little inside baseball here. Let's hear some inside, a little inside baseball. baseball here. So, uh, man, it, it had to have been about a year, maybe probably about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, I have always, you know, I always run the show. Uh, I've always hosted it. I've always been like, you know, we we've we've done we've done stuff where we've changed, uh, you know, the live stream around every once in a while. But there was a there was like a week where I wasn't going to make it about a year ago. And so I gave Mark the admin password and everything. Well, that's so we could just log in. Mistake. Well, I me thinking, okay, he's gonna log in and he's just gonna use this for this one show, right? No, Mark has taken it upon himself to log in as an admin all the time. So if you ever watch any of our live streams, occasionally you might see like a banner flash once or twice. And that's because I've clicked on a on something to highlight, and Mark has also clicked on it. And so I click it on, he clicks it off, or vice versa. Um and we have a, a very, very loyal friend, lo- loyal friend of the show, loyal. Like he watches everything we do. He comments. He he gives me feedback all the time. Uh, our, our friend Stephen, um, and uh, so he he's in chat all the time. Stephen Fox. And since Mark's gotten like admin powers, he's gotten drunk on power, and. You know, like I said, I we've we could sit here and air you know m- grievances about like you know Mark Mark is a very imperfect human being like like we all are right <laughs> like we all are but um, if there's He's one just thing catching strays left and right if there's just here. one thing that Mark loves to do is run a joke into the ground. I mean, this man is still talking about about. Caleb talking him off a horse like seven years ago. It feels like, um, but Stephen was Stephen said something smart in chat like seven or eight months ago, and so Mark put him in timeout, and everyone thought it was funny, right? Everyone's laughing, right? Well, Mark has proceeded to do that so many times that Stephen literally refuses to watch our stream now <laughs> because he just saying. keeps up putting him. And so I'm like, like when you when I see this, right? I was just reminded about Mark give, being given admin powers, as being drunk with power. So yeah. hi, Mark. Um, you know, you've caught about seven stray bullets. I think you caught stray bullets the the show before too. But uh, yeah. Um. Now, now I got to tell you, I am no fan of running jokes and bits and gimmicks into the ground. And neither is my friend Beamy. My friend Beamy, which I won legitimately several months ago, and I both really hate gimmicks. We really hate the things that just get driven into the ground and driven into the ground and driven into the ground to the point where you really just want to strangle somebody. I mean, who in their right mind would do this? Who in their right mind would do the things that Mark Capitan does, allegedly, I have never seen this, I have never been on a stream where he does this, with driving jokes into the ground. 
I didn't I didn't realize that I was doing this podcast with Andrew Capitan. Hey, you know, champagne Capitan. It's it's got a, it's got a thing. The difference is I got some hair. The the funny the like you, we said Capitan. Uh so the first time we went to um and played in that last chance, first chance, right? You get you get a little card with your name printed on it, right? Well, mine obviously said my name. I don't know how, but Marks ended up saying Mike Capitan. Like, so we called him Mike Capitan the entire the rest of the trip. Um, and I on horse tourneys, I forgot he did really well in in a tourney. I forgot which one it was. Uh, and uh, I think it's Eric Wing, I think, is a guy who writes the blog. Yeah, he's their communications guy. He's an all-time good dude. He used to work for the NYRA way back when. So he apparently, you know, I like, he, you know, he always puts people's, like, nicknames in, mm -hmm. like, quotes and stuff. So, like, yeah. I just assumed, like, these are people's real nicknames. But all of a sudden, like, I see Mark up there. It says Mark, in quotes, E-L, L, Capitan. Now it's like, all right, so this guy's just making people's nicknames up now. And so we so we we call Mark L. Capitan every once in a while in, in jest there. So shout out to Eric Wing for giving uh giving Mark a nickname there. But uh <clears throat> yeah. Um but yeah, I mean it's it's just been crazy, uh crazy, uh crazy week. Um obviously uh, not me forgetting to change my name, me forgetting to change the drink and champagne background until uh, halfway through the intro. So we are just off to a great start. But hey, uh, you know, we're setting a low bar and we're just gonna keep going up and up and up and up and up. It's this the way we do things here on the On the Wrong Lead Network. And by the way, cheap plug, if you like what we do and you're watching this on YouTube, go down below, hit all those fun like, comment, and subscribe buttons. If you're listening on your podcast network of choice, feel free to give us a nice high rating and a nice review it really makes our tummies feel warm and fuzzy so you'll be helping us do that thank you very much for that hey, in advance if you if you like us on apple podcast like us on spotify too and vice versa i mean yeah. hey double double the fun for sure. um but yeah andrew you've you've been uh you've been busy obviously you you were in vegas uh two weeks ago now and we haven't had a chance to talk about it so uh tell me did you eat at the oyster bar at palace station i did not because the lines were absolutely insane Okay. Um, that was not a place we got. However, big, however, if you've been to palace station, you know, the neighborhood surrounding it is not great. It's just not, there's not a lot of options. There is, however, one option across the street. I'm referring of course to Chick-fil-A that saved my butt. Now make any remarks you want about Chick-fil-A, you know, from a political standpoint, I get it. I hear you. I understand you. Having said that, when the options at Palace Station are not all that great, you know, you're, you're left with reevaluating where you want to get your stuff. Now, it was actually a really good trip from a monetary standpoint. Came back with more than I left Northern California with. So that's really good, especially given, hey, it was a five day trip, right? I'll tell a couple of quick stories here because any Vegas trip is nothing without a couple of stories. The big one. I believe I've told the bye-bye Coach K story from a year ago on this show. For yep. those that had not heard it, long story short, guy got way overconfident last year at the NCAA tournament in Vegas, was screaming bye-bye Coach K when Michigan State was up three with four minutes to go. Duke doesn't just rally to win, they rally to cover. And that guy, of course, long gone. We have a sequel to that. The sequel is, I'm quoting here, let him shoot it. Second round of the tournament. Kentucky is playing Kansas State. And already I can hear things being thrown because it's a horse racing podcast that's talking about Kentucky basketball losing. So I apologize in advance for anybody that gets hit with any strays because of that. But it's a fun game. Kansas State's guards are exceptional. Oscar Shebway for Kentucky, exceptional. Going back and forth, throwing haymakers. Marquise Noel of Kansas State hits this ridiculous three from the half-court logo, the big March Madness. It's, you know, bang, N nothing but net. And the guy that apparently has Kentucky is screaming, let him shoot it, let him shoot it. Because, hey, it's a bonker shot. He's not supposed to make it. And I will give him this. He was right. He wasn't supposed to make it. But you could sort of tell he had had a few at this point. Because every time Kansas State came down the floor, our friend was screaming, let him shoot it! Let him shoot it! 
Well, let me reenact what happened. Let him shoot it. Bang. Let him shoot it. Bang. Let him shoot it. Bang. All of a sudden, Kansas State is up six or seven, and they're going to win the game. And all of a sudden, everyone in the Palace Station Sportsbook within earshot, anytime Kansas State has the ball, is yelling, let him shoot it. Let him shoot it. (laughs) Of course, the guy that was screaming, let him shoot it, had beaten feet out of the sports book. He was gone with about a minute and a half to go once he realized Kentucky wasn't winning the game. So once again, kids, don't be that guy. Just don't be that guy. Bad things happen to people who choose to be that guy in Las Vegas. It doesn't end well for anyone involved. That reminds me of the uh, the bell ringer. Told the bell ringer story, right? No, you haven't. Are you sure I haven't told the bell ringer story? If you have, I've forgotten it. We uh, this was um, the year the Cubs won the World Series. Uh, was that twenty sixteen? Yeah. Um, I'm in the Link Sportsbook. They're playing the Dodgers, and there were some LA fans that were sitting in. And this is. I think since okay, I've heard bits and pieces yeah. of the story, but I don't think I've heard the whole. But thing. basically, long like this was back before they remodeled the sports book again. Yeah, this was when they did the whole like man cave thing, where like yeah. they had the TVs and the couches, and you could, like would walk up to the like the bar was a self serve bar. You put your beer there, and like they charge you by the ounce. Like it was it was pretty snazzy, but it was yeah. short lived. They they put gaming tables and stuff back in there. Yeah, but um. They there was a guy sitting there who had one of those little like hotel bells, and every time the Dodgers got a hit, he's just sitting there slapping the shit out of this bell. Um, and uh, we all know how that that series ended up going. And the, yeah. the first day or two, he's sitting there slapping that bell. Uh, by game three, he was not slapping that bell anymore. And uh, I, I had half a mind to go up and start smacking the bell for him uh, every time the Cubs got a hit, but. It was, if uh, you had gone up and slapped the bell, I think he would have gone up and slapped you. So. I probably would have gotten shot. Yeah, um, I, 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 I'm just, I would be dead. And, and that transitions into my second Vegas story because I felt like I was going to get shot. Nice. Second round game. Gonzaga's playing TCU. If you watched this game, you know how this ended. Gonzaga is up four. I have TCU plus four. TCU commits a foul. 0.7 seconds left. Gonzaga goes to the line. First free throw, good. Second free throw, good. So Gonzaga is up six. TCU does the roll the ball up the floor play. They get across half court and nobody's touched the ball. And people on Gonzaga's defense are, you know, doing slapping raps with the TCU players because the game's over. Not to the TCU guy closest to the ball. The ball takes one bounce across half court. At the apex of the bounce, this guy reaches up and in one fell motion, swish at the horn. TCU loses by three and covers. Ball goes through the hoop and I yell, yes, while I'm playing blackjack at Palace Station. It becomes readily apparent to me when about 12 people look at me with glares that would melt steel that I am the only person in that bank of tables and perhaps at Palace Station that had TCU plus four. A whole bunch of people lost a lot of money on that one shot. And there was a video of the Circa Sportsbook after that shot got taken where you can just see some people going, Yes. And some people going, what the hell? Like that's sports betting in a nutshell. Now I'm not sure if that was the worst bet beat of the weekend because Mm -hmm. there was that one. And there was the Oklahoma state game in the NIT where the camera didn't show the last second three because they cut away to the handshakes and the guy wasn't supposed to shoot either way. If you were on the wrong end of one of, or both of those games, and you decide you don't want to bet on sports anymore, I completely support your decision because those were two of the most miserable beats you're ever going to see in your life. I just happened to be on the right side of the TCU game. Yeah, I, um, I even with football, um, I've often said, you know, I much prefer playing the money line versus 
you know, playing the spread because of just the, that weird fuckery that happens. I mean, like games get games get won and lost the same way too, right? That right. last like that does happen, but I don't know. It feels a little bit more or, more organic, right? When a, when a, when someone hits a last minute three to win the game versus someone hits a last minute three to only lose by nine, right? And and you had them plus you had them, you know, you had the favorite, you know, minus ten or something, right? Like, yeah. It's 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 tough, but um, yeah, I actually uh, t- with with some help from you, assist from uh, from Mr. Andrew Champagne, uh, I had a, a heck of a weekend. Um, I <laughs> we talked a little bit about the weekend about like our, our I th- and I don't know if we talked about it on stream or if we talked about it um, uh, just off stream or off um, off air, but uh, we were basically on the opposite sides of that play in game right and yep. uh, obviously we know what uh uh fairly dickinson ended up doing so shout out tobin anderson guy i worked with at sienna college head coach at fairly dickinson i gave you fairly dickinson two weeks ago and you opted to take texas southern who went mm-hmm. about 14 and 20 over the course of the season and fairly dickinson doesn't just win the playing game of course they beat purdue and perhaps more remarkably gave florida atlantic a game Florida Atlantic, of course, now in the final four. And the coach of Kansas State went into the Florida Atlantic locker room after the Elite Eight game and said, you guys are going to win. You are the toughest team we have had to game plan for. And that's high praise coming from a Big 12 coach. Yeah, it's um, – I got I took some bad advice. Uh, probably one of the best bettors I know uh, who also has a really good sports betting uh, record – uh, said he loved Texas Southern. What was funny uh, was uh, I then found out that he couldn't bet that game at all because he lives in New Jersey. Yep. So, um, and uh, fairly Dickinson being a Jersey school. So he was like, it was like his favorite play. Like he was trying to find people to like make bets for him and stuff. He, not, he ended up not getting anything in. And so I, you know, took the leap with, um, with, I mean, it was a risk-free bet, but it was a, it was the largest sports bet I've ever placed. Uh, luckily, I got the, you know, the bet back. But then, uh, of course, I ran it back the next day and and failed miserably again. So, um, Friday though, um, I that was, was to, a good day, Josh. Yeah, I was able to connect on about a thousand dollars in parlays, which was just nuts. Thank uh, you, Marquette. Thank you, Kansas State. Thank you, late pick four at Oaklawn. That may have been the best all around gambling day of my life. Yeah, that was uh, that felt that felt really good. Um, and uh, I I think I I'm I'm up a couple hundred. I I mean I basically have missed everything. I've went probably like three three out of four in a bunch of parlays. Uh, one was really sick, and I forgot I forgot what game I missed, but it was just something disgusting um and i just was not like, didn't want to think about it but like i said like i don't know anything about about uh about college basketball i mean i'm betting coin flips basically i feel it feels like sometimes but uh but it's fun i don't know it, it's fun um apparently caesars really likes it because they they're probably the most uh at least of the sports books i've played with they seem to be the most like reward heavy they seem to be like uh, so. They must be going all in with, uh, with the the sports betting because like, I had like zero tier credits and I'm like almost at the next level and I haven't like bet that much. So I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's interesting well, what each of the uh, each of the different how each of the different apps uh, kind of work. Um, you know, I I know not legal in California, but you yeah. Working. I was going to say it must be really nice to be able to firsthand compare all of these legal sports betting apps and see which ones are, are great for rewards. Well, California, please get your stuff together. Well, I was going to say that maybe you you seeing as you work for the publication, you you might even know a little bit better than I do, kind of how they all work, but. Um, I I know the gist of it, but I don't know what kind of promos they were running during March Madness. Every place, of course, runs different promos. So chances are you got in on the good end of one of them, especially if tier credits wise, you were in you were in a really good spot. One thing that I will say about Caesars, I was at the Caesars Palace Sportsbook for a little bit. Dad and I ate at Bacchanal, one of the greatest buffets in the world in Las Vegas. It was supposed to be the Wednesday night. 
It wasn't the Wednesday night. That's the last Vegas story I have for you. We went on Thursday and we saw the end of the first round game with Texas. They were facing Colgate and they covered. And that sports book with the big, huge video wall that's curved and whatnot. I put out a panoramic picture on my social media platforms. It's, it's really cool. I like being there. The thing that I loved most though, we talked a lot on this show about how Vegas is trying to make money by charging for chairs in sports books, places to watch the games, the comfy chair section that was closest to where I was standing was probably about half empty. And I know they made money, but it made me a little bit happy to see that it wasn't a sellout because a lot of that stuff that Vegas casinos were doing for the tournament, trying to make money in that way, rather than the time honored tradition of, Hey, get to the sports book early. If you find a seat, it's yours until you leave it. That made me feel pretty good to see that it wasn't a complete smashing success. Like they probably wanted. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned that, especially about Caesars. Cause, um, I frequent the uh, the Vegas subreddit, and someone had mentioned something about. Um, I think they were getting they were going to get to the hotel early, and they were like, "What should I do?" And someone had suggested, "Oh, just go to the uh, front desk, and you know, most of the time they'll let you check in early." Um, and that used to be the case when I first started going to Vegas, even up until I don't know three four years ago, maybe like right before the pandemic. Um, Last last year when I went for NHC, um, we I stayed at Bally's, then Bally's, now Horseshoe, and it's I forget when check in is. If check in, I think is at three. Yeah, it's um, at three. So I'm there probably around two thirty, two forty, and I go up to the front desk. I'm like, oh, can I check in? And she's like, hey, she's like, if I check you in, like I'm gonna I'm gonna charge you. I'm like, well, what if I use the kiosk? She's like, no, if you use the kiosk, it's gonna charge you. It's automatic. And I'm like, all right, I'm just going to wait till three. She's like, okay, that's no problem. So I go and um, I just kind of walk around for about 10 minutes, right? So uh, I don't know. It's probably about, and, and I, it's funny because I'm just like standing in the lobby and I, I see kind of like this cycle of people going up trying to check in and, and walking away. Same thing as me, probably. They're not, they don't want to get charged $25 to check in 10 minutes early at this point. So it's like 255 and I just go stand in line. And the lady who told me, she waves me up. And I'm like, no, I'm waiting until 3. She's like, well, if you're waiting until 3, you can't stand there. I'm like, excuse me? If you're not watching this on YouTube, my head is in my hands right now. Because that's some of the worst customer service I have ever heard. So I was like, really? And so I, I walk away. And literally, like, it's once again a cycle. She tells people can't stand there. And mind you, this is NHC, NHC weekend. So me, I, I try to be as nice as possible to service people, right? You, you don't want to be, you don't want to be that a-hole. No. Um, I'm on vacation, right? I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm trying to stay, you know, relaxed. And so horse players, on the other hand, uh, are a little bit more vocal than I am. So now all of a sudden you hear all kinds of guys with New York accents starting to yell and being like, what the fuck is like, blah. And, and like all of a sudden you see this guy come out and he's wearing a suit and he's like, what's going on? And she's like, well, they're standing in line, but they're not. And she's, and she's, he's like, it's fine. Let them go stand in front of the kiosk. And so he directs us all in front of all the random kiosk. And he just tells each and every one of them, uh, one of us don't do anything until 301 that way you don't get charged and he walks away and i'm like dude was that so hard you know just like if you're gonna like you were trying to charge us 25 dollars a check in five minutes early at that point you know like and that that's the stuff that to me like drives me nuts right it's, because it should not occurs absolutely because it's like i go to vegas knowing that i'm going to be separated from my money I have a amount that I'm okay being separated from that I bring with me. Like, you're going to take it. Just let me hang on to it for a little bit. Maybe every once in a while you let me leave home with some of it. Like, like it's fine. But, like, this, like, $25 to check in five minutes early, like, is killing. I don't have the same experience at MGM. 
Uh, I've I've been a loyal MGM person basically since about the third or fourth time I've gone to Vegas when I, I noticed a somewhat of a disparity between the two products. Um, and I think being bought by the other conglomerate, um, El Dorado, uh, thank you, Carl Icahn, for uh, ruining another business. Um, and uh, so El Dorado, I think, has just gutted it. And it's just been, you know, it's, it's just not great. Um, and and I, I think you can notice the difference when you kind of walk through an MGM property and walk through a Caesars property, just just the vibe you get, just the cleanliness even, I think. Uh, I haven't I haven't been to Caesars in forever just because, you know, it, it, it's just it's just been such a bad experience. So it's um, tough. I mean, and the thing is, if you have one bad experience somewhere, it ruins that property for you. I had the worst blackjack dealer of my life at New York, New York, 10 years ago. You think I've wagered a dollar in that building ever since then? No. Mm -hmm. There's 20 other casinos on the strip. There's 40 other casinos if I want to go, you know, 10 minutes away. You don't do that. You go where your money and your time and your effort is appreciated. Yep. Horse racing, are you listening? <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> the last story that I've got centers around the worst travel day I have ever had. And this is nowhere near as bad now as it was when it happened because it was a good trip, got back safe, made a little bit of money. Everything's okay. We can laugh about this a little bit now. So I was supposed to fly into Vegas on Wednesday, the 15th. I was supposed to leave Oakland airport at about two o'clock. I was supposed to get into Vegas around three 30. This was by design. I wanted to beat the nighttime rush that always comes in the Wednesday night before the NCAA basketball tournament, get to the airport. Everything's on time. Great. TSA pre-check works fine. I'm at my gate in plenty of time. I'm able to rewrite some of my derby bubble because of litigates defection off of the Kentucky Derby trail. Fantastic. Get in line to board, get on the plane. We then start hearing things about weather in Las Vegas, not from the pilots or the crew, but on Twitter. And around this time, there's this guy, Biden, who couldn't take off from the Air Force base in Las Vegas because of military exercises going on there. So he had to take off out of Harry Reid. So regardless of anything legitimate that happened weather-wise, and I think most of this was weather, by the way, regardless of that, half the people on the plane thought, oh, it's Biden's fault. He's the worst. So we're sitting on the plane after having boarded for two hours. We finally move and we're headed towards the runway and some people start to get a little bit excited. I'm not, I am not proud of this, but I called it. I said, we've been at that gate for two hours. They're moving us because they need that gate for a plane that's come in. Sure enough, we get to the runway. We're not taken off. They bring us back to a different gate. And at this point it's almost five o'clock. They have to deplane us because we've been on the plane three hours. And at this point, all flights into Vegas that haven't departed yet are grounded because of a ground stop at Harry Reid. So everybody going into Vegas from anywhere that hadn't already taken off was hosed. About 545, they say, look, here's the deal. We have a window. We can take off, but we need everybody on the plane in their seats in the next 20 minutes. Passengers all followed suit. We stampeded onto that plane. We all got into where we were supposed to go. The pilots weren't ready. So we missed the window. We sit on the plane for another hour and a half or so. We finally get another window to take off at about eight o'clock. We take off flight smooth. We get into Vegas at nine 30. Naturally there's no gates because every plane is finally in Vegas after having been delayed six, seven hours. So it's about 10 o'clock before we get a gate. I get out of the plane. I go down to baggage claim. And the very first thing I hear when I step into baggage claim at the Vegas airport, which is huge, it's a massive, massive place, is someone on the loudspeaker going, we apologize for the delays. Uh-oh. It's not what you want to hear takes 45 minutes for us to get our bags. 
And then you have to go to the cab line outside of Harry Reid. And the line is not awful. It's bad, but it's moving. It takes about 15 minutes. And then something happens to me that has never happened before in Las Vegas. Someone stole my cab out of the cab line. I got told to go to spot number five. Person in front of me gets told to go to spot two or three. Well, spot two or three didn't have a cab and spot five did. So I'm looking around going, anybody see this? Is this just me seeing something? And there are people that are like, yeah, that was bullshit. And at that point, I don't wish ill on people generally, but I did say, I hope every single bad beat somehow impacts this guy (laughs) because you just don't do that. So finally I get into a cab and it's about 11 o'clock and I say palace station, please. Cab driver says, well, do you want the highway route or the city route? And at that point, I don't know why, but I broke. I said, sir, with all due respect, I was supposed to be here seven hours ago. Just get me there. So he gets me there. We take the city route. We hit every single red light. And it's about 1120 when we get to Palace Station. I haven't eaten yet. Nothing since lunch. My dad, bless his heart, waited to eat dinner until I got into town. Only thing open was a little diner in Palace Station. And I told the server what had happened, like, and how I should have been here seven hours ago, hadn't eaten anything. I say, I would like the biggest French dip sandwich you can legally make. (laughs) It's something out of Parks and Rec with Ron Swanson, where the steakhouse he wanted to go to in Indianapolis was closed, and he asked for all of the bacon and eggs they had, and then reaffirmed he wanted all of the bacon and eggs they had. So order gets in, we wait, food comes out. The sandwich was no longer than this Beamy Award. Had maybe three or four ounces of meat on it. Not good. Not good at all. Downed it in four bites and the French fries that were with it were ice cold. We were supposed to eat at the Bacchanal Buffet at six o'clock that night. Instead, I'm eating that at midnight. Worst travel day of my life. Thankfully, the trip itself was a lot of fun. Always enjoy seeing my dad in Las Vegas. Always relish the fact that we're able to do stuff like that and meet halfway when he's on one coast and I'm on the other. It's really, really cool. And we always have a good time. We had a really good time this time around. Shout out to everybody that treated us very well all weekend long. It was really cool. And we're looking forward to our next Vegas trip in November. So that travel thing, I can laugh about it a little bit now, but as it was happening, it's just one of those things where everything bad that could have happened did. Yeah. I, um, I've been lucky enough. And of course, let me. Yeah. um, Salt over the shoulder too. Yeah. I, I haven't had anything like super bad ever happen with travel. Um, I think part of it, is the fact that I haven't flown that much. Um, and the second part of it is I fly out of Chicago, um, which is generally just a big enough airport that I, like, I mean, I just haven't gotten hit by weather. I haven't, you know, there's, there's, I've just been extremely, extremely lucky. Um, I think the worst that we had was coming back from Vegas. We got delayed like six hours once. Right. Um, and we were already at the airport when this got delayed. Right. Which is, which is the worst part. Right. Cause like you get delayed, before you get to the airport, well, it's just like, all right, cool. I get to the airport a little bit later. But once you're already there, or in your your case, once you're already on the plane, yeah. Um, the worst I've had, I mean, I've I've had to sit on the tarmac for maybe an hour. I've had that happen once. Um, similar on both ends, right? Hey, we can't take off. There's like seven planes in front of us, and obviously, you know, an hour later, you're finally taking off. Or, hey, there's no gate available. We're just going to do loops until we can find an open gate um had that but i mean you got all of it multiple times on one leg of the trip and that's just it's just insane yeah now the one thing i will say is credit to southwest airlines because they did take care of people that complained the big thing that went wrong that i didn't mention earlier is when we deplaned at about five o'clock the big question we had is okay Now, all of these flights going to Vegas are delayed. There was our flight. There was a five o'clock. There was a seven o'clock. There was a nine o'clock. 
everything was delayed. The main thing we wanted to know is, okay, if we want to get to Vegas tonight, do we stay on this flight? Can we move to another flight? What's going on? Air traffic control told us your flight will take priority. Our flight did not take priority. The five o'clock and seven o'clock flights that were delayed still got in ahead of us. So the fact that people wrote in and complained about that, I wound up getting taken care of with a couple of travel vouchers that I'm probably going to use this summer. They did what they could. This wasn't a Southwest thing. This was a weather thing. It wasn't ideal. And a lot of people got hosed for it. But I remember sitting in the airport waiting for any news on the flight and thinking, those Vegas sports books really have to be sweating. Because think about how many people got stuck where they were. I mulled over changing to an LA flight and renting a car to go from LA to Vegas. But then we realized, wait a minute, if the weather is really that bad, the Traffic. mountains between LA and Vegas <clears throat> are going to be horrible. So decided against that and ultimately wound up probably doing the right thing. It just, it really stunk at the time. Yeah. Um, were you able to get the good seat? Uh, yes, I was All right, not initially. Not initially, but when we reboarded, the guy that was initially in the really good seat on Southwest over the wing with no seat in front of you, he was going to Baltimore and he had found another flight. He was supposed to be connecting in Vegas. So, so wound up fun- getting that seat. Yeah, funny story. I didn't have a, a middle seat on either of my flights. One okay. of the flights, I did get the, the, the bonus seat. Now, the flight out to Vegas, um, I don't know if I said this, but um, I got you know I got an aisle seat. I, I paid for early bird. Yeah. And I got B group. You were saying that. Yeah. And honestly, I'm expecting that too, because I'm traveling to San Diego in a couple of weeks and I'm probably getting that too, because it's just one of those things where depending on when you buy that, you wind up getting hosed. So we'll see how it goes. So I got B group uh, and I sit down and they're like, Hey, it's not going to be a full plane, but they said that. And then eventually when people were getting on, like they're like only middle seats available and they're like there were still i still probably saw like 20 people standing up and i'm like well clearly someone i i'm in the exit row still so like so i don't know i felt a little insulted that no one sat next to me like like i was happy but i'm like really like there's like there's probably only like five open seats on it and one of them was one next to me i'm like really hey That's, you know, don't feel insulted that's extra legroom. You get to spread out. You <laughs> won the lottery. Look at it that way. Uh, but uh, yeah, flying is always fun. Um, yeah, we're going to next... shop this podcast around to the travel channel, by the way. If anybody out there is a flyer and wants to sponsor us, our DMs are open. 6-3 and up. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll call our podcast 6-3 and up. The flying Indeed, podcast yes. for tall people. Yes. 6-3 um, at 30,000 feet. Oh, that's actually not bad. Oh. We, let, we, me, uh, let me write that one down. We had six three at thirty thousand feet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I've been looking for flights. Uh, I'll be going back to Vegas Memorial Day weekend nice. with uh, with my wife, so that'll be fun. Cool. Um, so Vegas is one of my favorite things to talk about. I mean, I could talk another hour about it, but um, one of your favorite things to talk about WrestleMania week. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes here. Uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't see if you were on Gino's podcast at all this week, but it's streaming live as we record this. It was myself, Gina Bacola, Darren Zocali and Chad Cooper. We went back and forth for the two day event. Yes. WrestleMania is two days now, people Saturday and Sunday at SoFi stadium in Los Angeles, California. I mulled over going, couldn't justify it with all the travel that I'm doing, just spending too much time in planes over the next couple of months, but really excited about that. It's the holy grail of wrestling is WrestleMania weekend and there's nothing like it when it's done right. So really excited about that. Really excited for a couple of predictions that you can find over there. Cheap plug Gina Bacola's podcast is that's what G said. The on the wrong lead folks have done that show a fair bit for any number of reasons. And in my case, the old wrestling rewatch is a big hit. We're coming up on a hundred old wrestling rewatch episodes. We're going to get that syndication money, Josh, one way or another. (laughs) So yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Always look forward to that. Much to the chagrin of my fiance, who now has to deal with the fact that this is basically a perfect Andrew weekend. And here's why. In addition to WrestleMania, these guys 
the LA Angels are in Oakland and playing the A's opening day Thursday, and then they play Saturday and Sunday. So I'm going to Saturday and Sunday's games. And then after those games are over, which will be in three hours with the new pitch clock rules, WrestleMania starts at five o'clock. It's timed out absolutely perfectly. And it's wonderful. So question, is it still, do you still have to buy pay-per-views or can you just, can you subscribe to Peacock? How does it work now? If you have Peacock, you have the WWE Network, and I am an Xfinity customer, so I get Peacock for free, which is actually a really nice perk. Okay. I might might watch. Also, uh, for your rewatch, if you guys ever do the 1990 Royal Rumble. Which one was 90? Um, Was that the standoff with Hogan and Warrior? I don't remember. Because we did that. We've done all the WrestleManias. So we've done those. And we did the 1992 Royal Rumble, which is the one that Flair won from the three spot that took place near my hometown in Albany, New York, at the old Knickerbocker Arena. So got to give a shout out to that. And by the way, if you followed me on social media and have seen my celebrations whenever I win anything of significance at Saratoga, you have seen the Ric Flair promo from after that match. Uh, that's the one uh, that Hogan won by throwing Mr. Perfect over yep. with a close and, and, and it featured the Warriors standoff midway through the match after they cleared the ring. Yep. You guys did that one already? Yep. That's a good one. So funny story about that one uh, is there was a video, there was a video rental store yep. uh, for people. Well, I was going to say for people who don't know what that is anymore, but <laughs> But it's a funny, logical thing. It was but a funny enough, trade. but like if anyone's going to know, I mean, it's going to be horse racing people. You yes. Know? So, uh, but yeah, it was, there was a video, a uh, mom and pop video rental store that was across the street from my house and they had a section that was like $1 rentals Yep. and they had a bunch of old wrestling tapes in there. And one of them was the 1990 Royal Rumble. So I rented the crap out of that, that every, like probably like once a month so i've probably seen this entire thing uh just a, a bunch of just so many freaking times well it's on peacock if you want to rewatch it again i might have to now that might i might have to uh i believe uh ted dibiase starts it out and i think coco beware is, is number two the bird man yeah so uh yeah that was man that brings back some memories but yes uh, we yeah. are all indeed very very old I mean, anybody, any any person born in the '80s, any any male born in the '80s, has at one point in time been in completely engulfed by wrestling. Like, yes, I, I, and I, anyone who says otherwise is dead wrong or no. a liar. Even if it was like when they were seven, right? Yes, like like they, they somebody they've watched something. Yeah, but now um, the the story with wrestling with me is. My dad got very tired of watching the same types of, you know, videos that kids my age watched at this point. It was 1996. So that would make me seven, I think. Yeah. Born in late 88. So all of a sudden one night in May of 96, he fires up WCW Monday Nitro on TNT. And it's the episode where Scott Hall jumps over the railing and announces we're taking over that wound up being the NWO angle that featured Kevin Nash and, of course, Hulk Hogan. If that's the first thing you see when you're watching professional wrestling as a kid, you don't shut it off. Hmm. Oh, man. But, um, yeah, so that, that should be a fun weekend. I, I, might, I might watch if I got, if I got time. Uh, it's going to be good. I didn't know. I didn't know that it was part of uh, Peacock. Now you told me you told me this a couple weeks ago, and, and that yeah. that's like, oh, that makes it so much easier now. Yeah, they uh, they sent a boatload of money WWE's way, and it's a shame that that happened because the original WWE Network, which is still available in other countries, was one of the greatest over the top video services ever made. They spent a year on it. They had people from MLB Network's team that designed a lot of their stuff, design this. And you could tell that a lot of care went into it because it was functional from day one. There were not a lot of bugs, nothing like that. All of a sudden, Peacock comes in, sends a whole bunch of money, and they have to rebuild everything in six weeks. 
a lot of bugs. Still some things that aren't great. If you look at pay-per-views, or as WWE calls them now, premium live events, they're built into seasons, like TV shows, and there's one episode per season. It's not good. Not good at all. I miss the old network. Yeah, it's been... Um, uh, Peacock's is not great in general. Um, I, I've One of my favorite shows, uh, probably my favorite show of all time, is a show called Psych. Which is uh, was on the USA Network, yep. um, and for the longest time it was, I believe, on Netflix, and then it made its way to Amazon Prime, and then it also made its way to Peacock. Um, now I, although I have both of them, I, I watch it on Amazon Prime all the time. Amazon um, Prime is great, but yeah, the Peacock had like some of the the movies and stuff that that started coming out after the show ended, and. Um, yeah, it's just it's just not great uh, trying to navigate no. through that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, let's actually talk some horses here for the last fifteen yeah, minutes. I, was say, I know it's supposed to be a horse racing <laughs> horse racing like, podcast. Thankfully, but, uh, there's two Kentucky Derby prep races, even though with the exception of one horse, they both kind of stink. Yeah. So, well, here's the funny thing. Let's rewind a little bit and talk about last weekend. And um, <laughs> Andrew, I told myself. I was not going to get talked into two fills, in not not in this last race. I loved him in this last race. I sent I sent it in, uh, at, on the uh, and I think I got seven to two, which I thought was more than fair, uh, and you know just blew the doors off that field. Um, and I told myself like immediately after the race, I was like this this horse is going to win. This horse is going to win the Derby, right? But it's going to win the Indiana Derby. Or the Ohio Derby, right? Like I think he's going to be a good, you know, a secondary. Maybe derby. the West Virginia Derby. Maybe the West Virginia Derby, derby. wants to ship there. Um, but then, then I saw the number, and I'm back in, baby. Just when I, just when they pulled me out, they pulled me back in. Josh, Josh, let me tell you a little something about this three-year-old group. It's slow. There is one horse in this three-year-old division that is not slow. Yeah, two fills. He ran the the highest buyer out of any three-year-old so far. On synthetic. Yeah, so now he's going to come on dirt. The poly pop, that number's going to go up. Okay, you can bet that horse without me. If Forte is the horse we think he is, he's not losing. And here's Hold on, stop. If Forte is the horse you think he is, if Forte is the horse any sound any person of sound mind thinks he is, he is not losing the Kentucky Derby. I'm now, just telling you, if he loses the Kentucky Derby, I'm going to go full Dennis Green on you. Okay, fine. And be, they are who we thought they were. Okay. And we so, didn't leave him off the hook. Here is the theory that I have leading into the Florida Derby, which, of course, features Forte breaking in post-11. If the Kentucky Derby is run right now, Josh, what are Forte's odds? Uh, probably five to two. Lower. I'm thinking, and I did a little bit of research on this. I put it out on Twitter. With the exception of the 2020 Kentucky Derby, where Tis the Law was three to five, and that's the pandemic derby. There were a lot of things going on there. No horse has been below two to one since point given in 2001. 22 years ago. Forte could well do that. If you like Forte, like I do, if you think Forte is the class of this three-year-old crop, if you want any semblance of any type of value on Forte on the first Saturday in May, post 11 at Gulfstream Park in the Florida Derby should be like trumpets from heaven. And here's why. Good. Thank you for that. So this is my thinking. If that post position is that prohibitive and he doesn't win, and I'm thinking he runs, if he doesn't win, he at least runs a credible second or third, beaten two or three lengths in the post position costs him the race. He's still favored in Kentucky but he's not eight to five or nine to five. He is five to two, three to one. 
you've just doubled your value on a horse that is still a credible favorite. If you like Forte and you think Forte is the class of this three-year-old group and you want to bet him on the first Saturday in May, you better hope the post position costs him the Florida Derby. That's going to help you. Yeah, exactly. Now, Todd Pletcher was not crazy about the post position draw, and there were some people that thought he was going a little bit too far with it. Post 11, going a mile and an eighth at Gulfstream, there's no run into that first turn. He can win, but he has to be much, 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 much the best, and no other horse has to move forward. I don't think he's a cinch on Saturday, but that does not change my opinion on him being the horse to beat on the first Saturday in May. Now, what I'm very interested in on Saturday, Josh, it's a horse named Mage, breaking post position number four in the Florida Derby, did not have a good trip in the Fountain of Youth. He was wide. He wound up maneuvering between horses. It was his second career start. It was his first start against winners, first start going two turns. He was fourth, but probably second best. If he moves forward, he could win the Florida Derby at a little bit of a price. But the important thing is, if Forte doesn't win, that does not make him a toss in the Kentucky Derby. I mean, I, the, so there's something that you said that really actually got me super excited. And it's something that I think you make a really good point. And that's when you compared uh, Forte to the biggest fraud, uh, fraud horse of the past 97 years. Which one was that? Tis the law. Over, I don't know if I'd go over hyped. That horse won a Belmont, won a Travers, won the Florida Derby. That's not over hyped. That's a multiple grade one winner. Garbage that horse, horse. Won, that horse won the race named after me 100 years before I was born. Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I... I kind of hope Forte just airs. Uh, th- there's just there's nobody in that race. Like it's it's very much there's very they Mage very much might dodge. be a runner. I'm just saying that Mage might be a runner. A runner on turf maybe. No, good magic. That horse ran a magic's fine been... race. Ran a fine race in the Fountain of Youth. Just inexperience took over. I think he might improve. I'm in a couple of contests and that might wind up being the play for me. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I am. You know, going back to other Florida preps, um, I'm very, very hopeful that Rocket can can get into the gate because if he can, or if um, who's in this race, uh, West Coast Cowboy, if he can get enough points to get in, uh, Mr. Caleb Knight will be owing me a bottle of bourbon. Well, there he go. said because he said, and I quote, "There is no way any any." horse from this holy bull is going to get into the derby gate well rocket can might already have enough points i hope so now i just need i need i need to bubble wrap them bubble wrap bubble wrap all right no fevers no nonsense bubble wrap them um yeah and so there's been a lot of talk about this arkansas derby um i have not um I have not looked at the field for this yet. I'm actually pulling it up now. Um, but I honestly, like what's really tough, I think, about this Arkansas Derby is um what happened with is it Arabian Night? Arabian Night, yes. Yeah. Arabian Night romped in the Southwest, was going to be favored in the Arkansas Derby. They took him off the Derby Trail. And you could sort of see it coming if you listen to Bob Baffert after the Southwest when he said, this is a horse that needs time between races. He said the same stuff about life is good and life is good wound up needing more time. And that's ultimately what wound up happening. I'm no expert on horse anatomy, but I remember seeing a young life is good draw away from everything in sight and every stride looked like it said, ouch, 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 ouch. Arabian yeah. night, not quite as ouchy to the eye, but not a shock, heavily built horse. And when you get that kind of weight on a horse, it's going to be tough when the feet have to hit the ground. So that's, that's tough, but also confidence game is not running in the Arkansas Derby either. Keith DeSormo has said 
He might run in the Bluegrass. He might run in the Lexington. He may well train that horse up to the Kentucky Derby. So that was another blow to the Arkansas Derby as well. Yeah, and I mean, there's a couple of, of decent horses in the Arkansas Derby. I think people are a little, um, maybe a little underwhelmed by by what's in there. But it, it looks like you're going to get an honest pace in that race. You got, you got, you got a little bit of speed in there. Um, you know, obviously reincarnate, I think is going to probably end up going off your favorite, which is I the would other, think so. Yeah. The other yak teen, uh, horse, but you know, rocket can who, uh, we aforementioned rocket can is going to be in there. Angel, angel of empire who ran a really nice race. Um, uh, was it the risen star? It was the risen star. Yes. The thing that hurts him is that race did not come back well in the Louisiana Derby. Sun Thunder didn't run well. Curly Jack didn't run well. It didn't reflect all that well. He's got, I think, take a step forward. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we'll be, we'll be talking a little bit more about, about these preps on, uh, on Thursday. Um, but, um, I'm, I'm glad to see that you're still on, uh, that you're still on Forte, and um, I I actually told somebody earlier that if um, if Larry Ravelli uh, makes a phone call to the West Coast and uh, calls uh, Mr. Jose Valdivia Jr. and says, "Jose, we're getting the band back together in the Derby," and you know what Jose may... Valdivia is going to do? He's going to channel Et Baird and say, "When I ride Ravelli, I know, I know I'm, I'm live." live. You knew oh, we had yeah. to incorporate that commercial. If you have not seen that yet, l- go to YouTube, look up Larry Ravelli commercial. You will hear a young Joe Christofek narrating, and you will see a lot of names. That's who it is. Yes. I was, th- I was trying to figure out yeah. who was narrating. It's Joe yeah. Christofek. That's so yep. funny. Good guy. Sharp handicapper. Good dude. Uh, but yeah, if uh, if Jose Valdivia Jr. gets the phone call, I may go bankrupt. Uh, out of just respect for Arlington. Um, if, if Jose Valdivia gets the call and you go bankrupt, we'll be selling ad space on the on the edges of drink and champagne. It'll look like in Talladega Nights when Ricky Bobby sold the windshield. Yeah, there you go. That was the one funny line in that entire movie was Ricky Bobby selling the windshield. The rest of the movie, garbage. It's okay. I'm used to getting booed. I don't know what to do with you sometimes, Andrew. It's okay. Very few people do. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that was a uh, that was fun. It was fun. I yeah. I I know we we you know I I was talking earlier. You know one of uh one of my my friends Bill. He uh, he's an, he's a regular listener, and he's like, man, you guys are killing me with all this Vegas talk. So <laughs> so hopefully uh, maybe one of these times we'll 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 get him out uh, out to Vegas. But uh, uh, yeah, no, it's uh. Yeah, it's been a fun couple weeks, uh, and now, you know, we we're about a month away, uh, you know, from from Derby, and yeah, now now we're really gonna start to see the field take shape. I this is when, like, look at, uh, like I you know I being facetious for the most part about uh, about the aforementioned two fills and stuff like that. I mean, who knows what's gonna run this um, this weekend, right? I mean, maybe an allowance horse just you know jumps out of, out of the window and all of a sudden someone else, like somebody else impresses or takes the eye like you don't know um but this is kind of when you start to really see the field completely take shape um so i'm sure over the next month we're going to have tons of uh analysis over these races um i believe uh, we'll probably start looking at workouts you know what um, else we're going to look at? Yes, bath photos right there. Bath photos. Uh, shout out to Jay Privman. That was his absolute favorite thing on Twitter. If you tagged him in a bath photo or video, he would reply, bless you. He hated bath photos oh, and videos, God. man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say I hate replays, but I really don't. It's just, it's a lot of work and I'm lazy. Well, one thing that I will say before we call it a night here, with handicapping the Derby, There's a lot of people that will handicap that one race totally differently than literally every other race just because of the name of the race. Don't be those people. By all means, watch workouts, watch replays, whatever. But don't do anything that is a stark deviation from the things you do if you pride yourself on being a successful handicapper. If it's not broken, don't fix it. There you go with a little fist pump there. But uh, yeah, 
that's going to do it for us. Uh, check Andrew out at Andrew Champagne. Uh, I'm at Cherry Drank. Uh, we'll be live Thursday night at a normal time covering Florida Derby, Arkansas Derby. Like, subscribe, do all that stuff. Andrew's pointing wildly in different directions, but I think he just had different be proper nouns that were associated with here as yeah. the as the funky baseline kicks in. <laughs> all right, we'll catch you guys later. Have a good weekend, everybody.